Hi, everyone, and thank you so much for attending this webinar today. My name is Michaela Jackson, and I am the Prevention Policy Manager for the Hepatitis C Foundation. And today we're going to be talking about preventing liver cancer by increasing access to hepatitis C treatment. And we have three wonderful organizations on the line with us today, a panelist who will be joining and offering insight as to how we can help increase access to hepatitis C treatment. So just to begin, we have a quick little um, housekeeping slide. So first, I think this uh, presentation will be best viewed on your computer um, so you can see the slides and get the information. This presentation will be recorded, so you will also be getting them um, sent to you as well. Right now, all of the attendees are in listen-only mode, so you can feel free if you have a question or anything comes up to just drop it in the Q&A box and uh, we will get to them at the end where we have a little bit of Q&A and discussion time. So if you have a question for any attendees, just feel free to drop it in the chat and or the Q&A box and we will be sure to answer it later. So first I wanted to start off by putting things into perspective. I think there's a lot of talk about treatment, but um, costs can sometimes be a mystery. So to the right side of the screen, we have the average retail price of hepatitis B treatments in the United States as of last year. And the cheapest one for the first line treatments, the ones that are prescribed most often in the United States, is actually $957. So almost $1,000 for a generic treatment in the United States for one of the most commonly prescribed hepatitis B treatments. So as you can imagine, it's not that affordable for many people to be paying $1,000 out of pocket. And health insurance is supposed to help supplement those costs. And as we'll talk about later today, there are additional barriers that really contribute to individuals living with hepatitis B having high out-of-pocket costs, even if they have health insurance here in the U.S. So the first three treatments that you see on the screen, um, the ones with the little asterisks next to them, are the first line treatments in the US, prescribed most often have uh, little side effects. And the other few that are down there are all, everything's FDA approved by the way. The other few are um, treatments that are not as commonly prescribed, but we do um, look at them to kind of get a feel for what the price is across the US um, in terms of hepatitis B treatment. So to put things into perspective, we can talk about costs, we can talk about barriers, but we really need to understand this is impacting individuals every single day. So we, as the Hepatitis C Foundation, receive consults um, from all over the world. And over the past few years, we've seen a rise in people contacting us in the United States asking for help and financial aid in regards to hepatitis C treatment, which is really what informed us and let us know that an issue was occurring. And so we have pulled two really moving stories out for you guys today to kind of shape the rest of today's webinar and really showcase how big of a problem this is. So first, WL said that each time I have to change insurance due to a job change, it's the most, single most dreaded problem that she has. So prior to um, writing us in one of her old jobs, she was paying $232 a month for 30 days of treatment, which is already pretty expensive. Then when she switched jobs, the only option that she had was to pay $650 a month for a 30 day supply with insurance for the same treatment that she was already um, taking before. And mind you, this is a generic treatment that she was on. And so she says she worries and often has anxiety because there's a lot of miscommunication at the end of the month uh, when it comes to her provider, her pharmacy, and the insurance company talking because her medication, even though it's generic, requires a doctor's approval in order for her to access it. And so there's a, a delay sometimes where she has to worry about if she has enough pills to last her until the next month and her medications tiered at tier three for generic. Andrew had a similar issue, but slightly different. So he moved states. And so with his state change, he was in between jobs for a little bit and the, um, his family had no insurance. So they were forced to pay $900 a month for a 30 day supply of their treatment. Once they got insurance, 
the company charged them $500 for brand name, even though this is a medication his wife had been taking for many years. And this was um, after the generic became available, the insurance company wanted everybody to switch over, but the doctor that she was with at the time didn't necessarily feel comfortable because she had been on it for so long with doing it immediately. So they were forced to pay $500. Once they switched to generic, there was really no cost savings. Um, they had to pay $200 a month, which was already the base cost for the uh, insurance uh, for the brand name treatment. And they went through about of extreme frustration where they appealed to the insurance company. They were searching for any sort of affordability within um, the insurance company and outside resources. They experienced significant financial strain from going to pay $900 a month to $700 a month for many months while they went back and forth with the insurance company, and it actually damaged their credit score. So we're looking at this in real time and seeing that individuals are not just worried about, um, you know, their health and potential cause of liver cancer when they're doing this, but they also have all these other stresses and strains when they're just trying to access their treatment. So what does a discriminatory health insurance plan look like? They typically have one or more of these four um, barriers listed on the screen. And these are just an example of some what we've experienced with hepatitis B. Hepatitis B is not the only disease or virus that um, is impacted by discriminatory health insurance plans, but these are some sure um, signs that discrimination might be occurring in within these plans. And so the Hepatitis B Foundation put out a consumer report last year that examined uh, 14 states in the U.S. and really looks at all the plans to see trends of where this is occurring and we're looking at um, what are the common factors when it comes to people ex experiencing barriers to hepatitis B treatment. We looked at 284 health insurance plans across those 14 states over the course of two years. And essentially what we found were that these are the four core um, problems and areas, if you will, that we were seeing uh, difficulties and people were expressing uh, errors in accessing their treatment. So essentially, we looked at civil liver plans on the federal exchange because the plans that are on the federal exchange must follow all the protections that are set forth by the Affordable Care Act. However, as the overall general trend that what we saw throughout all 284 plans was that many health insurance plans on the federal exchange specifically design their plans so that they're not blatantly saying that a person can't choose it, but the plans are making the price of the medication so expensive that people don't want to choose it. So they know that they're going to have to pay more for your hepatitis B treatment, and they're going to place the burden of the cost onto the consumer using um, one or more of these four methods um, and the method, methods that we looked at earlier. And now I can send it over to um, a colleague at the AIDS Institute to talk a little bit more about their Hey, thank you so much. Um, so we can go ahead and just move into the next slide while I introduce myself. Um, so I'm Stephanie Hengst. I'm the manager for policy and research at the AIDS Institute. And what that really means is that I spend a lot of time um, looking into different health insurance programs and how insurance can either make it easier or harder to access care and treatment, in particular for people living with HIV and hepatitis. Um, and today I'm going to cover what is called a copay accumulator adjustment policy, which is a very uh, nuanced policy within health and private health insurance. Um, and so when I say that, it's kind of building on what Michaela was just talking about. Um, this is health insurance either through the marketplace like healthcare.gov or state-based exchange, or we do know that these policies are in employer-sponsored coverage, what you might get in a three-year job, um, but it doesn't apply to Medicaid or Medicare. Um, and before I get into really what these copay accumulators are and share some of the findings from a research report that we did, um, we can actually move to the next slide. Um, I'm going to add a little additional um, information about health insurance plans and how they're designed um, in addition to what Michaela already covered, and in particular how changes to these plan designs can impact um, access and affordability of treatment. So over time, health insurers have changed the way that health plans are designed. And what are the, those changes are doing is shifting more and more cost onto beneficiaries or patients. And I kind of use those terms interchangeably. Um, and so we know that higher costs, you know, is a direct 
<laughs> barrier to access and treatment. Um, so higher costs, you know, can be related to higher prescription abandonment and lower adherence to treatment regimens. And it's not just, you know, when we're thinking about the plan design, it's not just about monthly premiums, you know, that we do see those have gone up and those are pretty pricey as is. Um, but there are other variables that have caused people to pay more and more out of pocket. Uh, we can move to the next slide. So one example of how plan changes have happened or what plan change designs have been over the several years um, that have shifted more costs onto beneficiaries are deductibles. So this is a, a bar chart that shows how the average deductible for marketplace silver level plans, which is a pretty common plan, um, it's increased over the past six to seven years pretty significantly. And deductibles are really an important variable in plan design um, because wherever the deductible is set is basically a threshold um, that you have to pay up to before your health insurance is actually gonna kick in and the company is paying their portion of the healthcare costs. So as these numbers are rising and you're paying more and more out of pocket before the health insurance is like doing their part. So we can move to the next slide. So in addition to you know, the rising deductibles, there's also um, you know, much more use of coinsurance for um, the higher tiers, especially for specialty, especially for specialty tier drugs, um, like for hepatitis B drugs. And rather than paying a flat dollar amount under a copay, so even that could be a couple hundred dollars perhaps, um, you're paying a percentage of the total cost of the drug. So that's another very significant cost that is adding up. And so because of these costs, you know, patients are having to seek financial assistance to help cover these costs, their monthly costs. Um, and when you're having to choose between, you know, rent and groceries or paying, you know, $1,000 for a prescription drug, you know, that's a hard choice. And so in turn, many people apply for manufacturer copay assistance, but also charitable foundation assistance, or even seeking assistance from, you know, maybe a family member to help cover their costs. So we can move to the next slide. So now for copay accumulators, um, these are one new way that insurance companies are again shifting more costs onto patients. So patients can use their copay assistance um, to cover their monthly cost of the prescription drug, but it's behind the scenes that the insurance companies are refusing to count that amount of money from the assistance towards their deductible or their out-of-pocket cost for the year. And so that delays the patient from getting from reaching that deductible. And it puts the patient right back to square one of having to pay thousands of dollars to get their prescription, which is the problem in the first place and why they had sought out copay assistance in some form. So we can move on. So these next two slides are, are kind of intricate, um, but what it basically shows are there's two scenarios, this one in the next slide, um, what a patient pays out of pocket and what the insurer is also collecting you know, under whether there's a copay accumulator in place or there's not. So in this case, this is kind of how copay assistance works over the course of the year, what the patient would pay out of pocket and what the insurer collects when there is no copay accumulator in place. But we can move on to the next slide, which is what happens when there is a copay accumulator in place. So just like the previous scenario, the patient can use their copay assistance. It looks to be, you know, just fine for the first couple of months on that first line they're using it, they're accessing their prescription drug. But what you notice here that's different from the previous slide is that the, re the remaining deductible line is not changing. So the deductible is not being reduced at all despite the insurer collecting that money. So in this case, miraculously, the patient happens to have $1,000 in May and can pay a portion of, you know, once the assistance has run out, the remaining portion of the prescription cost can get their drug. And that's when you'll see the deductible begins to be reduced or whittled down. But I think we can all imagine that, you know, there are many patients out there, many people generally, that don't have a thousand plus dollars to throw down. Or in the case that, you know, Michaela was talking through, you know, $500, $900, that's a lot of money. And um, in that case, if you don't have the money, um, you know, perhaps you would have to leave your prescription at the pharmacy, Maybe you're able to get the money together that month and you pick up your prescription, but perhaps you're reducing your dose or skipping doses. So you stretch it out farther over maybe two months, which, you know, is that really beneficial to your health? <laughs> you know, probably not. It could cause other, 
other issues with your health. Um, and it's just, you know, a really dangerous situation to be put in by your insurance company. And then additionally, I do want to point out for this, you know, just as importantly as this is a, a major barrier for patients being able to access treatment, but at the same time, the insurance companies are gaining a lot of money from these policies. So while the patient's being faced with this major barrier, their bottom line is being padded by these policies. They're collecting almost twice the amount of money from both the copay assistance. And then when the, if, if the patient is able to pay, you know, the money um, for their deductible and their copays and coinsurance that the, the copay assistance should have covered, they're collecting all of that. And it works out to be at least, you know, about double, depending on the cost and the variables, um, more than what they would get otherwise under a no copay scenario. So you can move on to the next slide. So what um, the ACE Institute did, has done um, in this field is to document and kind of assess what is happening in the marketplace landscape around these policies. So over the past or the earlier this year, we published a report um, that documented this and it shows exactly how many insurance companies and where these policies are being used, um, how if these tactics are being used, et cetera. Um, and the results are that, you know, in every state that didn't already have legislation that banned copay accumulators. Every other state, so 45 plus DC, have at least one plan that's in their marketplace that has a copay accumulator in it. So we can move to the next slide, which shows a visual representation of what I was just talking about. So in the 14 red states, um, every single plan offered in those states on the marketplace has a copay accumulator in it, meaning that there's no option to select a plan that's going to honor copay assistance. And then you have varying degrees, you know, the pinks and the orange, that uh, there might be a plan or two in the state that has, that would honor your copay assistance. Um, but it's just, you know, it's overall not great for patients. Um, oh, one other thing to note about this is um, these are 2021 plans. We are hoping to update the report to show what's going to be happening in the next. Um, the upcoming plans for 2022 with open enrollment soon to be here. Um, and but from this map and from the, the current report, you can kind of get a sense of what to expect if you're shopping for a plan. OK, next slide. There we go. Um, so the good news is that, you know, I mentioned at the beginning, there were some states that had already passed legislation. There were five states going into 2021 that had passed legislation that prohibited copay accumulators in their marketplace plans. And over the course of the past several months, there have been an additional seven states. So now there's a total of 12, all the green, the dark and the light, um, that have passed legislation that requires insurers to honor copay assistance. So you may be one of the lucky people who live in one of these 12 states that starting in 2022 will honor your copay assistance going forward. Next slide. Um, so now going back a little bit more detail on the report. So you know, the, the main finding is that copay accumulators are everywhere. They're in every state and so many plans. Um, but the other thing about it is that insurance companies are not being upfront about this information. Um, there is, you know, if they make it available um, on their websites and their policy documents, they tend to be very hard to find. It's not labeled copay accumulator. Um, it's just a description of kind of how they're implementing these policies. So it's hard to find. The language that they use can be very vague. Um, and we can move to the next slide. But ultimately, what that means is that it's hard for consumers to really know um, what they're getting you know, when they're purchasing a plan. And then often, there were times when this information was not available in written form. We had to make phone calls to ask a consumer representative um, if they knew if this policy was being implemented. So all in all, um, you know, it's, it's not great to arm, you know, they could be doing a lot more to arm beneficiaries or potential enrollees on what's available in their plans. And don't you want to be a savvy shopper and know what you're buying? Um, I would think yes. So that's just one more aspect of, you know, the, the difficulty with these policies in particular, um, in and of themselves, they're harmful to patients, but also, you know, how do you know whether or not this is in your plan? So just one more detail about that. We can move on to the next slide. 
Um, so lastly, you know, we work with, as the AIDS Institute, we work with other um, coalition organizations in coalition and patient groups to influence policy um, at both the state level and at the federal level. And so, as I mentioned, you know, there have been many states that have already passed legislation. We're also working to have a broader legislation or regulation happen um, that would be cover the, the whole U.S., um, but the other aspect of that is, you know, as advocates, the one thing that is incredibly helpful and very powerful is personal experience and personal stories. So if you or a family member or if you're a patient navigator and you work with somebody who um, encounters a copay accumulator, um, we would greatly appreciate, you know, you reaching out and letting us know because we can use that information in conversations with policymakers, um, especially it's, it, with states, you know, this, it's a, it's a hard concept to really understand. It's a very wonky policy thing. And so having concrete examples of, you know, were you able to get your, your medication? You know, how many hoops did you have to jump through? Were you unable to get it? And what did that do? Those are the kinds of things that, you know, people in this, in this network can help um, bring to light so that we can influence our, the policies at the higher levels. So I can talk about this for days. You can move on to the next slide. Um, my information is there. Feel free to reach out to me. Um, I'm always happy to answer questions or talk more about this or other access barriers um, that we can hopefully change. So thank you so much. We can now turn it over to Mary and Joy uh, to talk a little bit more about patient navigators and how they can assist individuals. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Mary Chang from Charles B. Wong Community Center, and I'm a care, uh, patient navigator, or you can call us a care manager. I'm in the Chinatown, Manhattan location. Hi everyone, good afternoon. Uh, this is Joy Zhu. I'm hepatitis B patient navigator at the Child Bureau Community Health Center, Flash Insight. So let me uh, just give a background about uh, Charles B. Wong Community Health Center. Uh, so Charles B. Wong was founded in 1971 in New York City, and we are a federally qualified health center offering comprehensive primary care services to all. And we have uh, multiple, uh, you know, prof uh, providers in the office. We provide adult medicine and also pediatrics, OBGYN. We have dental and we also have mental health. And we also have social workers and health education departments that su provide support for our patients and the community. So we currently have four clinical sites across Chinatown Manhattan and Flushing Queens. Next slide, please. So I just wanted to give a little background of our hepatitis B population. So as of February 2021, 20, we have 9,000 patients in our hepatitis B registry. Um, and that basically means that we've seen, um, since the day that we've been open, we've seen 9,000 patients with hepatitis B. And currently 4,000 patients are active. And that means that um, the patient has been to our office at least once within the last two years. And of the 9,000 patients that we, we've seen, 3,000 patients do not, have, do not have health insurance. We currently have two patient navigators, so it's um, Joy and I, and I work in the Manhattan location and Joy is in the Queens location. And we currently have 600 patients in, enrolled in our care management program. And basically what that means that is that we both uh, provide care for, you know, patient, patient navigation care for these patients. And uh, most, most of the patients are not insured, but we also do help insure patients. And most of the time, these patients are patients who need help with medication, uh, like patient assistance programs, and also patients who need help with referrals, um, or patients who are a bit more complicated, who have cirrhosis, 
or liver cancer. Um, and also lastly, we uh, help pregnant women who have hepatitis B and we're trying to prevent their baby from also getting hepatitis B. Next slide, please. Um, so what do patient navigators do? It really depends on the location you are in or the facility. Uh, you're working with, uh, but for Charles B. Wong, uh, Joy and I, we, um, we also talk to patient providers to help, you know, figure out uh, the best care, the best database. One of these things is their blood work appointments and also So their follow-up appointments and when we them schedule the appointments. And also, if we're not able to reach them, we always will send out a, a letter, you know, just, just to, to see if they're able to come back. Next slide, please. So one, one thing that we hope that, you know, patients do is the liver cancer ultrasound screening and you know, some patients who don't have insurance, we try to find a local imaging site for them with low cost. Or if not, um, if they, you know, want an even lower cost imaging, we try to refer them to a public hospital where they maybe have a sliding fee, you know, based on the patient's income. And we will schedule the appointment for them. If if they need uh, more follow-up imaging, like a CAT scan or MRI, we can also do that for them. And sometimes if, when the results come back and there's like a mass and they need to see a specialist, we can also help them schedule an appointment to a local, a local specialist or if, they prefer, we can also you know, schedule an appointment to the hospital, the public hospital, where they is the fibrosis. Uh, it's, it can be called, and this is also a to go to the hospital. The next part, a big part of what Joy and I do is tracking a patient's medication. Um, so a big part is what, what we do is tracking the medication. And if a patient doesn't have insurance, we can help them apply for the patient assistance program. And And if they have insur if they don't have insurance and they're not able to get documents to apply for the patients program, we can refer them to a low cost pharmacy in the area. And there's also patients who have uh, insurance, but they have high copay, like mentioned earlier. And there are patient assistance program uh, that you know are coupons, copay coupons that can help them reduce the costs. So when the patients come back and when we see that their, their labs, their lab values have worsened from last time, we call, we call them and check in on them and see if they're taking the medication and if they have any issues. Like some patients might have pharmacy issues or um, just, you know, reasons like that they cannot, they haven't been taking the medication. So we check up on them to see how we can help them and address the matters. Next slide, please. Yeah. 
Okay, so I will introduce the barriers and the challenges our hepatitis B patients might have experienced. Language is a big issue for our patients. Most of our patients are immigrants who cannot speak English or are not fluent in English and often have a hard time navigating the healthcare system by themselves. Patients usually prefer a seeming provider who can speak the same language as them. If the patients live in other states, they will travel to New York City for care. If they are unable to come to New York City, many patients will not see local doctors because they are worried about the communication since it's hard for them to find doctors who can speak their language. Some patients are unable to return regularly for follow-up. Some live out of state and the cost of travel is expensive. For the transient workers, they are not able to control work schedule and some patients have very busy work schedule. For them, making money is a priority over their health. Since the COVID-19 pandemic, it's harder for patients to return to New York City for care due to scale of getting COVID-19 during the travel. Patients can do phone or video visits, but they are unable to do physical assessment. Many who live in other states have trouble getting labs or liver cancer screen. Difficult getting medication. There are pharmacies that mail medication to patients. Also the patient assistance program can mail medication to patients, but some uninsurable patients may not be able to get the required documents for assistance program. For example, a patient's employer may not write proof of income later. Even insured patients, they may have high deductible. Some patients may run out of medication because of loss of insurance. Many patients prefer not to renew insurance due to the cost. They are not aware that there are assistance programs and low, low cost pharmacy. So having patient navigators who can speak and understand the hepatitis B patient's language and the culture is very important. As Mary mentioned, our two patient navigators can speak their language and help monitor their hepatitis B through our hepatitis B care management program. Yeah, thank you. Yes, yeah, so I think many people are wondering where do we, where to find a patient navigator? And so there are, there might be patient navigators at health centers. So when you see a provider or if there's a medical staff, you're, you can talk to, ask them if there's anyone in the health center who can help. And also in your local community-based service, uh, social service organization, check any organizations here that might have people there who might be able to help. Thank you so much for that. And now I'm going to pass it over. Oh. And also for uh, and New York public hospitals, there's also care managers there that are able to help. And in the hospitals, they also have on-site specialists and pharmacies, low-cost pharmacies. So patients can, you know, get everything done at a hospital. And you can check the website that's uh, available, like uh, if there's anything in your area. Thank you. Great, sorry about the interruption. Um, there's a little bit of a lag in between um, the words, so I apologize for that. But now I'm going to pass it over to Emily to talk more about open enrollment and what this means for people who are looking for health insurance plans. Hi, can everyone hear me? Okay. 
So my name is Emmeline, and I am a fellow with the Asian and American Pacific Islander Health Forum. We're a nonprofit based in DC and also Oakland, and we do advocacy for promoting the health of all Asian Americans and Pacific Islander and Native Hawaiians. So I'm going to just hop in to show you a little bit about the upcoming open enrollment period. So I should be sharing my screen now. This is healthcare.gov. Um, so open enrollment starts November 1st to January 15th. So it's coming up pretty soon. Um, but you know, there's still like of time to prepare. So we encourage you to kind of start thinking about what your plan is. So one thing to keep in mind is that you might be in a state that does not sign up for healthcare through healthcare.gov. And these states are, one moment. So um, if you look at this list here, um, these are the states that have their own marketplace. So for example, you have California and this is going to take you to a different website. So that is California's website. Right now, I am actually on the healthcare.gov website that will tell you what marketplace is in your state, but you can also Google and just look up um, healthcare enrollment in Kentucky or Maine. These three states, uh, Kentucky, Maine, and New Mexico are actually newly using their own marketplace for 2022 coverage. So there is a possibility of still getting enrollment in 2021 healthcare, but that's actually in very specific cases. So that would be a special enrollment period. Um, these would be if you had life events, like you got married, you had a baby, or you adopted a kid, um, someone in your household has passed away, um, you got divorced, uh, and various other, other situations. So if you think that you've had a life change and you have lost your health coverage, then you should look into seeing whether you can apply for health coverage for right now. And it would start in either the upcoming month or the month that you are in, depending on when you are signing up. So also, if you are eligible for Medicaid and CHIP, you can apply for that at any time. So you don't need to qualify for it with a life event. All right, so for 2022 enrollment, you can do this um, multiple ways. You can look online, you can use their website, um, you can apply through the phone, you can apply through mail, but you know, for visual purposes, this is the website that you go to, so healthcare.gov. Um, if you already enrolled before, you might actually be just automatically renewed, but we still suggest that you try and like look into your options anyways, because you might actually have a cheaper plan. Uh, the laws have changed a lot in the last year, so there might be a new tax break or a deduction that you are qualified for. And then if you are just doing a new enrollment, then you will have to gather a lot of documents. So there's a really helpful checklist that I like to show people if they are trying to get ready to figure out what information they need. And this would be here, it looks rather long. Uh, so that's why we suggest that you get ready earlier before November 1st. And so you, for example, need your um, social security number or some information about your household. And the most helpful thing is also your last tax uh, filing. So I encourage just uh, if you have some free time, like five minutes, 10 minutes here or there, just take a look and make sure you know where everything is. All right. And part of what we do in the health forum is that we try and help uh, people who have language access issues and also uh, immigrant communities. So as um, Mary um, and Joy were speaking about language access issues earlier, one step that uh, I want to share some information about is how to get language access now if you are looking to apply. So they will usually suggest that you call them. Um, so they say you can call this number and then you can get language access. One thing to know is that you can't get language access 
unless you have a active account. And to open an active account, you have to submit various documents and some basic information. That might be difficult for family members or friends that you might be trying to help out. So uh, we actually think the best way to get language access is to go to a patient navigator, just like uh, the folks at Charles B. Wang Community Health Center. And the website here actually provides this at the bottom. There's something that says find local help. You can also see this here. Of course, it takes a few steps, um, but if you find local help, you can enter your city and state zip code. I'm located in Michigan, so I'll just put in mine. All right, and there is an extra step here. So you have to add a filter and then you can get language or interpretive services and you just mark that in. So there are various languages, including services to help um, specific communities. Uh, so just, yeah, it, it's a little frustrating because you know if you were not able to read English very well, it's not your first language, this is a little bit difficult to navigate, but it is out there. Uh, once you get connected with a patient navigator or an assister, then they can help you much, much easily, much more easily. Uh, there is a difference between agent, broker, and assister. Uh, they're like, I think the bottom line is that one of them gets the like, financial, um, like a, like a, I'm actually not sure exactly how it works, but they do get some money for helping you connect with insurance. All right, so if you uh, want more information, definitely feel free to contact me. The Asian uh, Pacific Islander Health Forum has a website and we have a landing page where we try and consolidate all of this information about language access and local help. And we also keep track of all the deadlines for the states and the regular healthcare.gov marketplace. So yeah, uh, thank you so much. I hope that was helpful. And I will hand it back over to Michaela. Thank you so much for that. I'm gonna pull my screen back up. All right. So now where can people find uh, financial assistance? So um, I know a few other great resources were definitely brought up. So I just wanted to clarify what Hepatitis B Foundation might send people to, but there are several um, out there where if you're experiencing financial um, strain or stress from Hepatitis B treatments, you do have options. So some of the top resources that we look to are uh, discount pharmacies and uh, coupons are also helpful. So Arts Outreach and Prescription Hope are two discount pharmacies that are online that provide hepatitis B treatments for, I believe the maximum is $50. You do not need insurance. Um, that is often a big barrier to some of the financial assistance that is available. Some people might need insurance, but uh, with these two, you do not. It goes based upon income, uh, household income level. And uh, basically, if you meet their criteria for that, then you will be eligible and you can access treatment for as little as $25 um, a month. GoodRx is a really, really great resource that actually helped um, Andrew from the store earlier access uh, his hepatitis B treatment for his wife. And they provide basically, if you type in your zip code, the amount of medication that you need and what medication it is, they provide you uh, with a list of pharmacies in um, markets, grocery stores, independent pharmacies, basically anywhere within your radius um, that you're able to travel to and pick up your medication. They will give you a coupon that will cut down the price significantly. And this does not need insurance either. You can use it with insurance as well. So that's another really good resource. And um, the pharmacy will just take that price off and you will get it for less. Now that is dependent upon um, some factors. It will definitely vary by state and location. So unfortunately, some of the treatments I believe um, will already be highly priced and then it might not take that much off. So you might wanna look around and shop around. Sometimes the best options for you might not be immediately at the top. So just take a little bit of time and scroll. 
Uh, manufacturers also offer uh, copay assistance programs. Um, again, this is often dependent upon a person having insurance. They have to meet certain eligibility criteria, but it will never hurt to look. And usually you can find that on the website. And finally, we have a list of various other uh, inform informative websites and resources on our website. And you can use the link right there to find them. And in our discriminatory um, consumer report, we did put together a checklist that you can see on the right, but when you're shopping for health insurance plans, you can go through and look at that and see what you might need to keep in mind as you're looking for a plan. Um, as our panelists mentioned, it's not only about deductible, it's not only you know about what your copay co-insurance is, it's a lot of factors that end up costing you more out of pocket. So there's multiple things that you might want to keep in mind. And finally, you can report the discriminatory uh, plans or plans that might be implementing some of these negative benefit designs that are harmful to directly to your state. So this is a really important step. One thing that states and insurance departments say is that they are not really allowed to look into anything unless it's being reported. So we really need individuals to report if they're feeling that this is occurring, if they notice that something's not right and they're having to pay $900 out of pocket every single month, you can, you know, take a look at the report, take a look at the information that's provided in the webinar and say, hmm, maybe I am being impacted by this issue. Maybe I should report it to your, uh, my state insurance department. And finally, I wanted to share this new resource that we've put together which is a new part of our Be The Voice Story Bank, and we specifically focus on treatment access issues. Again, this is a really, really essential part of sharing your story. One, it really inspires others to share theirs. Two, it helps make the issue known. A lot of people don't know this is occurring to them, so we really, really want to make sure um, that people are aware. And three, having these stories, we can then bring them to the table and see this is occurring. We need your help from legislators, from insurance departments, from anybody really. Um, so now I think we can move into the Q&A portion so I can stop sharing my screen and we can have um, our panelists join us. All right. So I can start with a few questions that we received in the chat. Um, one, I think, Stephanie, if you don't mind, I think you might be able to answer this question. Somebody is asking about pharmacy benefit managers. Do you mind explaining what that is? And then they ask, what do you see as the issues regarding boundaries between pharmacy benefit managers and insurance companies? It used to be the pharmacy benefit managers who manage directly by the insurance company, but now it's contracted out um, for PBMs. So do you mind just kind of giving an overview of what a pharmacy benefit manager is and maybe touch on that topic? Sure. Yeah, so, um, as, so pharmacy benefit managers often are, um, con as said in the, in the question, contracted to manage the pharmacy benefit as part of your health insurance. So if you can kind of think of it in, in different parts of what health insurance covers, you have your pharmacy benefit, which is you know, prescription drugs that we had talked about a lot about, but then you also have you know, maybe your medical services. So kind of two different areas. Um, and so the pharmacy benefit managers would manage that benefit in terms of um, negotiating the costs that they would pay for a prescription drug which then can impact like where on your the formulary that drug would be placed, like on you know tier two versus tier three, et cetera. Um, generally, it's kind of hard to separate out what a pharmacy benefit manager does from what the insurance provider does or the insurer does. Um, they're kind of all intertwined, and we know that often uh, pharmacy benefit managers actually um, encourage insurance companies or the um, insurer to have a copay accumulator within their plan. So it's coming, the influence is coming oftentimes from the pharmacy benefit manager or the PBM um, to the insurer. Um, and both are going to benefit from that assistance that they're collecting. Um, there's also a lot of unknown information kind of behind the scenes, the way in which their relationships are, are working, who's 
you know, getting what, I guess, from that copay assistance. Um, and then also these days, it, there's just so much intertwined, like um, insurance companies are now merging with pharmacies. So like CVS um, and Caremark, and I can't think of what the insurance company is, but like they're, they're all one and the same. So they will say that technically they're different and separate, but from our perspective and from a patient's perspective, it's all kind of one thing. Um, hopefully that answered the question. I know there's a lot of nuance in terms of like who does exactly what, but they're all kind of, <laughs> kind of all together. Yeah. I think that's incredibly helpful. I think um, a lot of people don't realize how difficult it really is to separate um, these things from one another. And that when we're tackling this issue, it really needs to be comprehensive and we can't only focus on one aspect of one overall change. So I think that's a really great answer and it really showcases just how problematic and how deep this issue runs. Um, so I think one person was talking about costs. Um, they're asking if it's per day, per month, or per year. So when um, the first slide that I showed, um, that would be per month, the average retail cost cost per month, which is generally uh, provides 30 pills. Um, the individuals and their stories, it was $900 a month and $650 a month for them. So that is how high it can get for some people. For others, it can be even higher than that. And um, you can buy your medication in 30 or 90 day supplies from insurance companies, um, but the ones that we were discussing today were per month. Um, Someone's asking if the, what we were discussing today is able to help people from outside of the U.S. Um, unfortunately, this is a very U.S.-centric um, topic because of the policies and regulations change per uh, you know country, um, and even the United States it changes per state. Um, there are resources available to help you within countries as well who often bring face this issue. Uh, we know that this is definitely a global issue and it takes a lot to tackle. We need advocates on a global level to speak up for themselves as well. I think that's, it's a very difficult thing to do, but it's one of the things that really helps to drive change. Oh, sorry, it was a bug. Um, but if you do reach out to the Hepatitis B Foundation, um, we do have our consult line and we're also able to help you uh, find resources in your own area as well. And so I know that um, Mary and Joy, you guys were talking a lot about uh, how individuals that you work with often don't have insurance and how that can uh, be an issue. And, you know, we see that issue as well. And so I was wondering, um, what, do, what do you see within your organization of how the out-of-pocket costs look for people who um, might not have insurance? Is it generally usually covered for um, people who don't have insurance based upon the programs you guys help them reach? Or do they still have to pay something? So for us, can, can you hear me? Yeah, you can hear you. Yes, so this is Mary. So for our health center, uh, we're very fortunate. We have uh, contracted pharmacies. Uh, we have a few in Flush, in Flushing, Queens, and two in Manhattan, Chinatown, and they provide low cost uh, medication to our patients. So the patient is responsible for for paying half the cost, and we're we're we pay that other half. So right now, I think it's uh, I don't I don't know the exact cost, but I think a a patient for maybe uh, Viriat, the generic form, it's only like $8 or $11 for them. And for Intecavir, I think it's also similar. And the thing is that there's no limit on how much medication they can get. So let's say a patient lives out of state and they won't be back in New York City for three, six months. The provider, if they think that the patient uh, is able you know, to take the medication on time, they will provide you know, prescribe that many amount of pills for the patient to bring back home. Um, and yeah, so a lot of times for patients who apply for a patient assistance program for free medication, they are able, you know, to, to get it. But if not, if they don't have the documents and for some reason they can't write English and they 
don't have anybody who helped them write English a letter saying how much a patient makes. And, you know, the, we really do refer them to these low-cost pharmacies. So yeah, our, our patients are very fortunate, I think. We have these programs for them. Thanks, Sarah. So, um, one of the things I think that is also also helpful to uh, address is just the fact that we're talking about populations in the U.S. Um, like you said, Mary and Joy um, and Stephanie and everyone really that might not feel comfortable coming, you know to the forefront and saying that they have these issues. One, for a lot of communities, especially immigrant communities, uh, have to just be still really stigmatized. So talking to people outside of their community, maybe such as insurance departments, might still be a little bit uncomfortable for individuals, which is why having people um, who speak their language, who are familiar with the community is a really essential part of making sure that people are have access to care. And so as Emily mentioned that you often have to call in um, to, you know, access the translator, something of that nature, somebody who can help you. Sometimes when we've heard this ourselves, that can be a barrier as well. So um, community resources are a really, really great help as well. Um, and then I think another thing that's really important to talk about is advocacy around this issue. Uh, I think we hear about it a lot. Um, I know it's Kind of becoming a larger topic in the news and things like that. But um, to our panelists, what would you say that they could do to one, advocate for themselves, and two, bring this um, to the attention of their own community members who might be doing or going through the same thing? I can. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead, Michaela. I can contribute. Yeah, I can. Sure. So, um, I would say I think from the experience of the Tennessee Foundation, um, it it really is about making sure that your other community members might know what's going on. This is a really hidden issue. Um, people don't realize that this is might be discriminatory and what they're going through with the health insurance plans. I think it's okay if we are providing the platform, for example, um, the AIDS Institute has a platform to report and talk to um, them about what's going on and answer a few questions. We have the same thing. If you guys share your stories, if you guys tell us you know, what's going on, we're able to not only link you to the care, but we can also help you help yourselves with talking about it to um, the people who might be able to actually do something about it. Um, Stephanie? Yeah, I, um, I think so every organization is slightly different. And so the AIDS Institute in particular um, doesn't have a direct patient population. We're not a clinic. We're not like a, a resource center um, that deals directly with individuals. Um, and so the way in which we kind of help connect patients is, you know, sometimes people do come find us and reach out to us through email or over the phone. Um, but what we try to do is if they have a direct service need, you know, work with other organizations, um, you know, like those on, on the call today um, that provide direct services. But what we can do in terms of advocacy is help uh, make you a better advocate by helping to, um, you know, give you pointers or tips on how to tell your story. Um, if there's something that you've encountered that is a, you know, barrier to, to treatment or um, some other situation like that, we can also help, um, you know, connect you to policymakers, legislators, 
local um, insurance regulators, whomever it may be, that would be appropriate for you to um, tell your story. Also, attorneys general in various states, they have um, authority over, you know, you know, looking at health insurance and saying, like, this might be discriminatory against, you know, a, a particular population or a particular disease group, like hepatitis B, whatever it may be. Um, so that's what it's, what we can do as, you know, our advocacy work is um, kind of elevating uh, what's happening to individuals and connecting that to, you know, policymakers or regulators. Um, this is a side note. I just am dropping a link into the last question about GoodRx and how they make their money. It's a good question. I don't actually know. <laughs> so I looked it up and I found a good resource that I'll, I'll send out to, to the group. Thank you. Um, so we are heading to four o'clock now. So is, does anybody have any final questions or panelists, do you guys have any um, final things that you might want to say to the community members who might be going through this issue? And yes, so the webinar is recorded. We can certainly send around the links um, as well. And Stephanie also dropped in the chat box the um, link to the how good our ex might make money, and our report is in there as well. So I think the most important takeaway is that you guys are not alone. There are many community members um, and organizations who are available to help you, and we're available to link you to the resources that you need. So please do not hesitate to reach out. Um, this is a really, really broad issue, and we're happy that we have a platform to talk about it here today and help raise awareness. Um, especially during liver cancer awareness month um, treatment access is a huge part of preventing liver cancer so thank you all for coming out today and i hope you all have a wonderful day Bye.